Chapter 8, Egyptian Chronology Introduction Just how old is ancient Egypt? A survey of contemporary textbooks on this ancient culture gives a first dynasty date of 3180 to 2900 BC. Dr. F. D. P. Wicker, for example, gives a first dynasty date of 2920 BC and advises his readers that Pharaonic dates are generally accepted as plus or minus 75 years at the start of the dynastic period to precision from the 26th dynasty onwards. The confidence that his dates are maximally only 75 years out is totally unjustified. Nor should readers be fooled by the apparent unanimity of scholars or their apparent refusal to discuss the problem. This shows little more than the pernicious effects of academic peer group pressure and the ability to put a brave face on the contrary data. Professors Jackson and Ben Yocannon are to be commended for continually raising this problem in their works. Despite the best efforts of historians and archaeologists over the last 200 years, the Egyptian chronology has yet to be settled in a way that synthesizes the known data. We propose to place the relevant conflicting information on the table with no attempt to paper over the cracks. The following table presents the chronological ideas of various authorities and show a great divergence of opinion. Only the chronologies of Champollion Figat, Petrie in 1906, Magnaughton, Pochin, and the present author bear any resemblance to the Egyptian record as preserved by Manetho. See inserted picture for the table. The documentary evidence. Perhaps the best overall source of Egyptian chronology would have been the royal papyrus of Turin. This document contained the names of 330 kings from the first dynasty to the new kingdom also the order in which they reign, and the lengths of each reign. Unfortunately, the papyrus crumbled in pieces while being transported to the museum in Turin. There have been various attempts to reassemble the fragments, but this remains a controversial exercise. In its present form, the document can only be very imperfectly read. In the 1950s, Sir Alan Gardner, an English Egyptologist, made an important attempt to reconstruct the document. Modern historians now have at their disposal a fairly useful king's list, but problems and omissions exist. The lengths of the reigns given by this document for some of the earliest kings seem very unlikely. However, Merabiapin, Enjib, and Semesin, Semerheket, of the first dynasty, for example, are given 74 years and 72 years on the throne, respectively. Ball Necher and Banater of the second dynasty are given 95 years on the throne each. The pyramid builders, on the other hand, are given reigns that seem unusually short. Djoser is given 19 years. Sneferu is given 24 years. Khufu is given 23 years. And Menkara is given 18 years. This is problematic because when Herodotus visited Egypt, he was informed that the Great Pyramid took 30 years to build, a figure widely used today. In the light of this tradition, the low figures cannot be accepted. The strength of the royal papyrus of Turin, however, is that from the 5th dynasty onwards, through the intermediate periods, a great deal of useful data is preserved. In our chronology, we rely on this document for reconstructing the 11th through the 14th dynasties. Another Egyptian source is the Tablet of Abydos. This tablet shows Pharaoh Seti I of the 19th dynasty, accompanied by his young son Ramses II, paying homage to 75 royal ancestors. The 75 kings are in chronological order, but the lengths of their reigns are not given on the tablet. Moreover, the scribe who compiled the text presented only a selection of the available kings. For example, none of the kings of the 13th through to the 17th dynasties are included on the tablet. No one knows what the criteria the scribe used to choose who got mentioned from those who were to be omitted. The tablet of Saqqara comes from the period of Ramses II. It contains a list of 47 kings, but the order and detail still corroborates the information given on the Tablet of Abydos. The Tablet of Karnak shows Thutmose III paying homage to 61 royal ancestors. The kings are listed in approximately chronological order, but it peters out during the 13th dynasty. When combined, the three tablets name over 100 kings from Mina to Ramses II. These tablets have proved invaluable in reconstructing the 10th dynasty. The Egyptian scribe, Manetho of Sebenitis, was a high priest of Heliopolis. He wrote his work, Aegyptiaca, during the period of Ptolemy Philadelphus. In this great work, Manetho was the first to divide the history of Egypt into the rise and fall of 30 dynasties. Unfortunately, the valuable text is now lost. 
today what has survived from it are quotations that appear in the writings of Julius Africanus, Eusebius, Josephus, and Syncellus. These writers, however, fail to agree on what they claim Manetho wrote. According to Africanus, for example, 561 kings ruled in Egypt over 5,524 or 5,373 years. According to Eusebius, about 361 kings ruled over a period of 4,480 or 4,470 years. Worse than this, there is no absolute agreement between them over the arrangements of the dynasties, the number of kings within each dynasty, or the lengths of their reigns. It is generally agreed, however, that the Africanist quotations best corroborate the other known facts about Egyptian history than the quotations of Eusebius. It seems certain, however, that Africanus double-counted the 17th dynasty. Adjusting for this and assuming a date of 343 BC for the fall of Nectanabos II, this yields a date of 5717 BC for the earliest kings of the first dynasty. Quoting Africanus, the first kings of the 6th dynasty would be 4426 BC, the 12th dynasty would be 3440 BC, from the time of Amon Hemhet the first, and the 18th dynasty would be 1674 BC. An assessment of Manetho's work contains no lengths of royal reigns that are improbable or unlikely. His account of early rulers of the first four dynasties, for example, is clearly superior to the given by the Turin Papyrus. For this reason, we rely on the document to reconstruct the early dynastic periods. In addition, we regard it as a reliable guide to the general reconstruction of Egyptian chronology. There are, however, slight differences between what we have presented here and that recorded by Africanus. Evidence exists here and there to show that there are some missing kings from Manetho's first and second dynasties. Manetho fails to mention Oraha, Mernith, Hatepsukumi, Parabesan, etc. We have added these kings into the basic structure recorded by Africanus. On the other hand, evidence for three of the kings recorded for Manetho's third dynasty is weak. We have therefore deleted them from our king's list. Nor have we accepted Africanus's view on the dynasty seven consisted of 70 kings ruling in 70 days, though it seems evident that he was not alone in holding this belief. Herodotus is another useful source of Egyptian chronology. He recorded that during his visit to Egypt, one of the priests read to him a list of kings from Mens to Sestrosis, in the context Ramses II. There were 312 Egyptian kings and 18 Ethiopian kings. Evidently, the priests did not inform Herodotus of the Hiskos dynasties, which is surprising, however. It's just how closely this data corroborates Manetho. According to him, or more exactly Africanus and Eusebius, the number of kings from Mena to Ramses II are given as follows. Dynasty 1 Eight the Knights, Dynasty two, nine the Knights, Dynasty three, nine Memphites, Dynasty four, eight Memphites, Eusebius gives seventeen Memphites, Dynasty five, nine Elephantines, Dynasty six, six Memphites, Dynasty seven, four Memphites, Africanus gives seventy Memphites, Dynasty eight, twenty seven Memphites, Dynasty 9, 19 Heracleopolitans. Dynasty 10, 19 Heracleopolitans. Dynasty 11, 16 Thebans. Dynasty 12, 7 Thebans plus Amun Hebhet, the first. Dynasty 13, 60 Thebans. Dynasty 14, 76 kings of Thwa. Dynasty 17, 43 Thebans. Dynasty 18, 16 Thebans. Dynasty 19, 2 Thebans, i.e., Seti the first and Ramses the second. Total. 339 kings. Our reckoning is slightly different of that of Manetho, but our conclusions are even closer to that to those of Herodotus. Dynasty 1, 9 Thanites. Dynasty 2, 12 Thanites. Dynasty 3, 6 Memphites. Dynasty 4, 7 Memphites or Elephantines. Eusebius gives 17 Memphites. Dynasty 5, 9 Elephantines. Dynasty 6, 6 Memphites. Dynasty 7, Four Memphites, Africanus gives seven Memphites. Dynasty eight, twenty seven Memphites. Dynasty nine, nineteen Heracleopolitan. Dynasty ten, nineteen Heracleopolitan. Dynasty eleven, seven Thebans. Dynasty twelve, eight Thebans. Dynasty thirteen, sixty Thebans. Dynasty fourteen, seventy six kings of Swa. Dynasty seventeen, forty three Thebans. Dynasty eighteen, fifteen Thebans. Dynasty nineteen, two Thebans, i.e., up to Ramses the second. 
total of 329 kings. The 18 Ethiopian kings spoken of Herodotus are explicable. Eusebius records 17 kings for Dynasty IV. He further states that Khufu was the third king of this dynasty. Presumably, Sneferufru and some other, as yet, unidentified king preceded him. Africanus records eight kings for Dynasty IV and eight kings for Dynasty V. Moreover, he lists Khufu as the second king of the dynasty. Africanus' view is the one generally accepted today, except the most writers allow seven kings for Dynasty IV and nine kings for Dynasty V. Dynasty V originated in Elephantine. In the time of Herodotus, Elephantine was considered part of Ethiopia, i.e. Nubia. This would explain eight of the Ethiopian kings. It seems evident that the 4th dynasty of Eusebius is equivalent to the 4th and 5th dynasties of Africanus, but with the mysterious king added to the beginning of the dynasty. It also seems evident that the Egyptian priests who Herodotus consulted shared the same view as Eusebius in classifying them all as part of the same dynasty. It is therefore followed that the 4th as well as the 5th dynasty shared the same Elephantine or origins. The notion that the 4th dynasty is from Ethiopia, i.e. Nubia, finds support from the fact that Khufu is also called Kunum Kuf. In some of the inscriptions, Kunum is, of course, an Ethiopian deity. This would explain 17 in the Ethiopian kings, i.e. 7 plus 1 plus 9. We believe that the 18th Ethiopian king is Nehesi of the 14th dynasty. Dynasty 14 is generally considered to be Asian, a view that we share. It is evident that Herodotus considered it indigenous. Herodotus, however, drew very different conclusions from those that we draw. He believed that the dynastic history of Egypt spanned 11,340 years on the basis that 341 generations multiplied by just over 33 years for a generation gives a total of 11,340 years. There is evidence that we shall discuss that approximately supports his view, but we hold a very different position. Diodorus Siculus is another useful source. He reckoned that the Egyptian history spanned more than 4,700 4, years, counting back from the Persian conquest of 525 BC. This results in first dynasty date of earlier than 5225 BC. Moreover, he stated that 470 kings ruled, of which four were Ethiopians and five were queens. There were indeed five queen pharaohs in Egyptian history. They were Merneith of the first dynasty, Nidocris of the sixth dynasty, Sebi Neferura of the 12th dynasty, Hatshepsut of the 18th dynasty, and Taurasset of the 19th di dynasty. Concerning the four Ethiopian kings, evidently Diodorus only considered the 25th dynasty to have been Ethiopian. These kings were Pi, Shabako, Shabiquo, and Taharquo. However, we do not fully agree with this figure of 470 kings from Menes to the conquest of the Persians. We think the correct figure, including the Hiskos dynasties, was 415. Perhaps Theodorus accepted the view shared by Africanus that Dynasty 7 consisted of 70 kings. This would produce a total of 481 kings, showing the discrepancy between the reasoning and ours of just 11 kings. Birth of the Short Chronology Contemporary Egyptology uses the 30 dynasty model that Manetho pioneered. Many writers, however, hold great reservations of using the Manetho Africanus chronology unmodified. The notion that Egyptian history began 5,000 years before that of the Greeks, for example, proved difficult to swallow. The fact that Greek scholarship corroborates it was neither here nor there. Scholars influenced by the Holy Bible also had problems accepting it. In the early 19th century, Sir John Gardner Wilkinson, a British Egyptologist, proposed a first dynasty date of 2320 BC. In 1887, Professor Edward Meyer of the University of Berlin proposed a first dynasty date of 3180 BC. Meyer correctly argued that very few Egyptian monuments are known to modern scholarship that date from the 7th dynasty through the 10th dynasty. Few monuments are also known from the period of the 13th dynasty through the 17th dynasty. Meyer concluded that these periods must have represented prolonged social and political chaos. For these reasons, few monuments were built. Controversially, he had concluded that many hundreds of years Manetho gave to these periods could not have been so. Meyer reasoned that many kings of the different dynasties must have ruled simultaneously over different parts of the country. The effect of Meyer's theory was to compress the Manetho chronology by over 2,000 years. In England, however, scholars free from the spell of Wilkinson remained unimpressed. 
Sir Flinders Petrie, the dean of the British archaeologists, wrote an eloquent defense on the Manitou chronology in 1906 and proposed a first dynasty date of 5510 BC. Sir Wallace Budge, then keeper of the Egyptian antiquities at the British Museum, preferred a chronology in between the ideas of Meyer and Petrie. He proposed a first dynasty date of 4483 BC. One obvious problem with using the simultaneous dynasty argument to compress the chronology is that it flatly contradicts the research of Herodotus and Manetho, two of our most important ancient authorities. According to Herodotus, thus far I have spoken on the authority of the Egyptians and their priests. They declare from that their first king to this last mentioned monarch, the priest of Vulcan, i.e. Ta, was a period of 341 generations. Such, at least, they say, was the number both of their kings and of their high priests during this interval. The priests offered Herodotus visual evidence of this, to cite Herodotus once more. They led me into the inner sanctuary, which is a spacious chamber, and showed me a multitude of colossal statues in wood, which they counted up and found to amount to the exact number they had said, the custom being for every high priest during his lifetime to set up his statue in the temple. As they showed me the figures and reckoned them up, they assured me that each was the son of one preceding him, and this they repeated throughout the whole line. Mena founded the Temple of Ptah in the First Dynasty, as we have seen. Five thousand years later, the priests of that institution were able to show Herodotus proof of 341 uninterrupted generations of priests who have presided there. This eloquently refutes the notion held by Meyer that one can compress Egyptian history by claiming simultaneous dynasties. Or are we supposed to accept that there were simultaneous dynasties of priests of Ptah also? Sir Flinders Petrie offers evidence that Manetho was quite capable of dealing with simultaneous dynasties when they occurred without the suppositions of modern scholars. Manetho has been often accused of double reckoning by stating two contemporary dynasties or kings separately. Every instance in which this has been supposed has broken down when examined in detail. Not a single case of overlapping periods can be proved against him. On the contrary, there are two excellent proofs of his care to avoid such errors. The 11th dynasty we know by the monuments to have covered at least one century, and probably two. Yet Manetho only gives 43 years, evidently because he reckoned the 10th dynasty as legitimate, and until that ended he did not count the 11th dynasty, which was partly contemporary. Again, in the case of a single reign, we find the same treatment. It is well known that Tukharka was reigning about 29 years before the accession of Samtek I. Manetho places three ancestors of Samtek before him, reigning 21 years in all. Here, it has been said, is a clear case of double reckoning of overlapping reigns. But just here is Manetho's care shown, for he cuts down the well-known reign of Taharka to 8 or 18 years. According to different readings, and this 8 years, but the 21 of the three other kings makes the 29 years of Taharka. In fact, he has only counted Taharka until he takes up what he regards as the legitimate line, and thus he ignores the 21 years of the reign, which overlap those of the other kings. On this reasoning, we think that Dynasty 10 and 11 were contemporaneous, but with the latter dynasty outlasting the former by 43 years. Similarly, we think that Dynasty 13 and 14 were contemporaneous, but with the latter dynasty outlasting the former by 184 years. Finally, we think that Dynasty 16 and 17 were contemporaneous. They both ended at the same date. Professor James Henry Breasted, an American Egyptologist, was a disciple of Meyer. He founded the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute, soon to become the leading Egyptological body in the world. In 1906, Breasted proposed a first dynasty date of 3400 BC. Due to the dominance of the Oriental Institute in the world of Egyptology, this chronology became the standard one used by Egyptologists. These days it has been inched down to 3100 BC or 3000 BC. Some textbooks now carry a first dynasty date of 2920 BC. Even though the modern chronologies are starting to approach that of Sir Gardner Wilkinson, the celebrated 19th century bigot, modern historians still derive their basic ideas on this issue from Breasted. We therefore let the masterly American scholar defend his ideas in his own words. The calendar is of an inestimable value to us in establishing the chronology of Egyptian history. 
where the helical rising of Sothis, i.e. Sirius, is recorded in terms of the calendar, it is a matter of the simplest arithmetic to determine, with a margin of four years, in what B.C. the rising occurred. As we have seen, three such dates are preserved to us, two of which each give the year of the king's reign, and from these the entire Dwarf dynasty and reign dwelt. The calendar is of inestimable value to us in establishing the chronology of Egyptian history. Where the hellacial rising of Sothis, i.e. Sirius, is recorded in terms of the calendar, it is a matter of the simplest arithmetic to determine within a margin of four years in what B.C. the rising occurred. As we have seen, three such dates are preserved to us, two of which each give the year of the king's reign, and from these the entire 12th dynasty and the reign of Amenhotep I and the 18th dynasty are established within four years in the terms B.C., they show that the 12th dynasty began in 2000 BC and the reign of Amenhotep I in 1557 BC, thus determining the accession of the 18th dynasty as 1580 BC. The Cahoon Papyrus and the Ebers calendar, it was argued, gave objective astronomical dates for the 9th year of Amenhotep I and also the 7th year of Senmorsret III. These dates can be judged from the rising of the star Sothis, which can be objectively calculated by astronomy. Fixing these two dates and adding up the lengths of the reigns for the other kings of Amenhotep I and Seven Warsets III's dynasties, fixes the 12th dynasty at 2000 to 1788 BC and the 18th at 1580 to 1320 BC. However, it remains to be seen if Breasted is correct in assuming that Sothis is the star of Sirius. In defense of the Breasted position, we can cite Leo de Put a modern authority on Egyptian calendar who wrote the following. Unlike agriculturally significant events such as the Indonation and harvest, astronomical events often occur at fixed times in the year. An example of an astronomical event that naturally presents itself as a yearly beginning is the hellacial rising in July of the star Sirius. Sothis in Greek, spit it in Egyptian. The fact that Sirius rises approximately when the Nile does only reinforces its role as marker of the new beginning. The Sothic rising came to be viewed as the herald of Indonesian. There is much evidence that the rising of Sirius was conceived as a yearly beginning. No evidence is more explicit than a passage from the decree of Canopus. There is, however, another major problem, but Breasted was aware of it. The fall of the 12th dynasty in 1788 BC and the rise of the 18th dynasty in 1580 BC leaves a time span of just 208 years. The Royal Papyrus of Turin and other documentary evidence shows at least 116 kings reigned during the Breasted's proposed 208 years. Breasted himself put the total at 118 kings. This seems to be far too short to a period to accommodate such a large number of kings. Breasted, like Meyer, claims that the several kings ruled at the same time in different parts of the country. To show that this was possible, he adds that, Under the Moslems, 77 viceroys held the throne of Egypt in 118 years, from 750 to 868 AD. In Europe, some 80 Roman emperors, after Commodus, ruled in a period of 90 years, 193 to 283 AD. See Meyer. The 118 kings enumerated in this confused age by the Turin Papias may have ruled no more than 150 years. 100 years is ample for the Hyskos, of which 50 years may be contemporary with the native dynasts. Believing this issue settled, Dr. Breasted proposed 315 years for the period between the 7th and the 10th dynasties, but adds that the, this estimate is extremely uncertain. Breasted further allows 925 years for the first six dynasties and 160 years for the 11th dynasty. This results in a first dynasty date of 3400 BC, calculated as 2000 BC, plus 160, plus 315, plus 925, equals 3400 BC. The truth is, however, the issue of the 13th through the 17th dynasties is not settled. Assuming simultaneously dynasties, as Meyer and Breasted claim, the time periods between the 12th and the 18th dynasties ought to be dictated by the longest dynasty of the period. Africanus informs us that the 13th dynasty lasted 453 years, the 14th dynasty lasted at least 184 years, the 15th 284 years, the 16th 518, and the 17th 151 years. Therefore, the logic of the Meyer breasted position should give a period of at least 518 years for the fall of the 12th and the rise of the 18th dynasties, not a measly 208 years. Quoting Eusebius, instead of Africanus, won't help their case either. 
Eusebius gives 453 years for the 13th dynasty, fully 245 years more than Meyer and Bresset have allowed. In addition, the 925 years Bresset allowed for the first six dynasties is inadmissible. Both Manetho and the Torin Canon, Egyptologists' only possible sources, allow more years for this period. The Torin Canon has missing values for over a dozen early kings, but even if these are discounted, the total number of years given still totals 949 years. Adding the missing values would certainly result in well over a thousand years. In addition, Diodorus informs us that Mena and 54 successors, i.e. dynasties 1 through 2-6, reigned for more than 1,400 years. This corroborates Africanus's figure of 1,494 years and our figure of 1,472 years. It should be clear then that the Meyer Bresta position is not based, as they claim, on simultaneous dynasties, but on whims and prejudices. Manetho Resurrected in 1932, Duncan McNaughton, a Scottish Orientalist, vigorously challenged the Meyer Breasted chronology. He argued that Meyer and Breasted were wrong to claim that Sirius was the only Sothic star and the Egyptians used as the basis for their calendar. Before 2036 BC, and even after, Spica, one of the stars of Virgo, was the chief star that was used. He further claims that the original New Year of the Egyptians began with the month of Hathor and not with the month of Thoth. In support of this view, McNaughton cites the following pieces of evidence. At all times, the Egyptians attached importance to the Isis, Sothis, Sirius, and in the late period regarded its rising as the commencement of the Sidereal year. Their original Sothis, however, was Spica, the star from which both they had the Babylonians measured their zodiacs and in the calendar of Zne, the day of its, i.e. the Sothic star. Rising is referred to as the beginning of the year of the ancients. In the Erythipes zodiac A, the old Sothic symbol of the star in the horns of the Hathor cow is opposite the beginning of Libra, thus confirming the importance of the sign as the first sign of the zodiac and of Spica as the measuring star. The Hathor Libra rising was the original first month of the fixed civil calendar and also indicated by references in the old inscriptions to the New Year ceremonies. From these brush deduced, according to Budge, that Sothis rose hellaciously on the first day of the Egyptian New Year, and when the sun god Ra had entered his boat, Hathor, the goddess of the star Sothis, went with him and took up her place with a crown upon his forehead. Also, in the hymn to Ra in the Book of Dead, the deceased officer Necht says, O thou beautiful being, thou dost renew thyself in thy season in the form of the disc within thy mother Hathor, thus clearly showing that the original New Year began with Hathor, not Thoth. MacNaughton demonstrated that the astronomical date for the ninth year of Amenhotep I was not 1557 BC, postulated by Breasted. Rather, it was 1674 to 1673 BC, using Spica as the Sothic star, not Sirius. In addition, Breasted et al. claimed that Epit was the 11th month of the calendar, when clearly it was the 10th. In other words, the short chronologists had to claim that Eber's calendar meant something other than it actually said. If Breasted et al. used Sirius without reinterpreting the Eber's calendar, they would have produced an Amenhotep I date of 1424 BC, an accept unacceptable date even to them. The Egyptologist Ebers explains when Naughton discovered a papyrus dated on the reverse the ninth and of the eleventh month in the ninth year of Amenhotep I, the script continues in the form of the calendar. New Year's Day, month 11, day 9. Teki, month 12, day 9. Menket, month 1, day 9. Hathor, month 2, day 9. Kaherka, month 3, day 9. Chef Bedet, month 4, day 9. Rekka, month 5, day 9. Rekka, month 6, day 9. Renanuti, month 7, day 9. Konso, month 8, day 9. Kenkat, month 9, day 9. Epit, month 10, day 9. This calendar thus explicitly states that Menket was then the first month. In the late calendar of Esne, two new years were celebrated, one at the rising of Sirius and the other, the new year of the ancients, at the rising of Spica. Calculations show that Spica rose on the ninth of Rehor Korti, the 11th month, then the equivalent to the 20th September. About 1676-4 BC, 
We have seen how in other cases importance was attached to the great conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn. Calculation shows that one of these fell in 1674 BC. Ninth, Rehor Kuti did not tally with the rising of Sirius. 14th July in south, 19th July in north, till about 1424 to 1404 BC, which is incompatible with any system of chronology so far proposed, including the Meyer breasted one. Consequently, those who consider that rising of Sothis is incapable of meaning anything else than the rising of Sirius have felt compelled to postulate that though Menhaket is called the first month, the calendar meant Thoth, and thus the eleventh month was Epit, though the calendar distinctly calls the tenth month Epit. This falsely yielded a date in the 16th century BC, which seemed to them satisfactory. MacNaughton's new date for the year 9 of Amenhotep I of 1674 or 1673 would lead to the 18th dynasty of 1709 BC. Incidentally, Africanus gave the year 9 of Amenhotep I as 1661 BC. Compared to MacNaughton's view, this is a discrepancy of 13 years. On Brest's chronology, the discrepancy is 104 years, i.e. 1661 to 1557. In Mesopotamia, i.e. Iraq and Syria, a clay cylinder of King Nabadonis was found. On this document is the statement that King Sharaktish Uriash reigned in Mesopotamia 800 years before Nabadonis's time. Since Nabadonis lived in 552 BC, this implies that Sharaktish Uriash flourished before 1352 BC. It is generally agreed among historians that the certain Berna Barash lived around over 120 years before Sharaktish Uriash. This placed King Berna Barash around 1475-1448 BC. However, Berna Barash corresponded with Akinhetan of Egypt and his letters have come down to us. Akinhetan obviously must have lived at the same time as Berna Barash. Mount Nauen places Akinhetan between 1501 and 1474 BC, and this harmonizes well with the Nabadonis' data. Breasted and other short chronologists place Akinhetan over 100 years later. To appease the short chronologists, specialists in Mesopotamian history customarily claim that there is an error in the Nabadonis document. In other words, the scribe should have said that Sharektish Uriash lived 680 years before Nabadonis' time instead of 800 years specified. It is on such make-believe foundations that the short chronology was built. At the Karnak Temple, additional evidence was found. In 1904, an alabaster water clock was discovered there belonging in the time of Amenhotep III. The clock was essentially a water pot with an aperture for outflow of water. On the inside rim of the pot are the numbers of the calendar months in order from 1 to 12. Under each sign of the month are calibrated intervals to show how far the water level has fallen. The calibrated intervals indicate 12 hours of the night measured by the level of the water. The lower of the water level, the greater the time period that had elapsed. However, the calibrated interval representing the 12th hour of time is lowest in the 3rd and the 4th months and highest in the 9th and the 10th months. This shows that the night in the 3rd or the 4th month was longer than night in the 9th or the 10th months. Why was this? An Egyptian hour of the night was defined as one twelfth, and the period from the sunset to sunrise, and not as one twenty-fourth of the day. During the summer solstice, the night was at its shortest, and therefore each hour of the night was at its shortest during the part of the year. On the other hand, during the winter solstice, the night was at its longest, and therefore each hour of the night was also at its longest. Filling the clock with the same amount of water, the clock will empty itself more during a winter night than a summer night, simply because the winter night was longer. The third and fourth months of the year must therefore be around the period of the winter solstice and the ninth and tenth months must be around the time of the summer solstice. For this reason, the calibrated intervals on the clock were further apart for the winter period and closer together for the summer periods. Duncan McNaughton demonstrates that during the period Amenhotep III, 1538 to 1501 BC, the summer solstice did not the summer solstice did indeed occur between the period of the ninth and tenth months of the Egyptian year. Using the Julian calendar, the solstice would fall on the 7th July. During the Amenhotep period, this date would tally as the 29th day of the ninth month and the intervening days to the eighth day of the tenth month. 
On the short chronology, however, the date of the Amenhotep III is 120 years later. During this period, the 9th and 10th months correspond with late March to the beginning of May. Clearly, this is the wrong date for the summer solstice. This elegantly refutes the short chronology date. David Roll, a most unlikely contemporary source, presented archaeological evidence that supports this date. At the beginning of the 18th dynasty, we have the eruption of Thera, whose ash straddles the late Minoan IA period in Aegean archaeology terms. For many years, archaeologists had tied LMIA into the early 18th dynasties on the basis of their ceramic chronology. This dated the eruption to the reign of the Amos, Amenhotep's first predecessor, or later. The date of the eruption established by archaeologists have recently received dramatic confirmation in M. B. Tech's discovery of pumice within a stratified context at Tel Ed Daba, Esbet Helmi, which spans the period from Amos to Thutmose the Third, O. C. Old Chronology, fifteen thirty nine fourteen twenty five B. C. However, C. fourteen dates for short lived materials from the Theron eruption span the period of seventeen sixty to fifteen forty B. C with the great majority far falling in the earlier period. As a result, in 1989, the Third International Thera Congress favored an eruption date between circa 1680 and 1670 BC. Of course, this was before the discovery of pumice in a datable Egyptian context. In the conventional chronology, the earliest Amos could have reigned according to Egyptian dating in circa 1550 BC, which is at least 120 years later than the date of eruption established by a radiocarbon method. If the eruption took place sometime later than the reign of Amos, the chronological chasm between Egyptian archaeology and radiocarbon dating would be even greater. MacNaughton further proposes much earlier dates for the 12th dynasty, bearing in mind that any proposed date must harmonize with an astronomically based date for the seventh year of Senwar Set III. He proposes a spica date of the 3274 BC. This is the latest possible date before Brest's failed 1880 BC that meets the criteria making the beginning of the 12th dynasty 3373 B.C. or 3389, including Amenhet I. This date corroborates Manetho's 12th dynasty date of 3440 B.C. Updating MacNaughton's ideas, we offer a 12th dynasty date of 3405 B.C. Incidentally, Africanus gave the year 7 of Senwar III as 3285 B.C. This is a discrepancy of just 11 years compared to Brest's discrepancy of 1,405 years, i.e. 3285 to 1880. Professor Brestet, however, dismisses such early dates for the 12th dynasty as hardly worthy of a serious answer. He feels that the gap of 1,000 years between the fall of the 12th and the rise of the 18th dynasty is not credible because it involves the assumption that nearly 1,500 years of history have been enacted in the Nile Valley without leaving a trace behind. It is like imagining that the European history we could insert at will, period equal to from the fall of Rome to the present. This is a bogus analogy. It involves unfairly comparing Egypt, a single country, with Europe, a whole continent. Dr. Breston implies that this is impossible for Europe not to have left remains behind them from the Roman period to the present. Quite true for the continent, but there are plenty of examples of indiv individual countries that have large gaps in their archaeological records. The professor's derision can therefore be ignored on this point. On the other hand, the Egyptian written record is perfectly solid. It is quite easy and very likely that 116 or more kings really did rule in a thousand years, excluding the Hiskos and 17th dynasty kings. The erudite Scott wrote the Brestit's argument at best. Shows that short reigns are possible. It does not show that they are probable. When we are compelled to choose between probability and possibility, it is the probability we must prefer. Manetho gave 60 kings for the 13th dynasty and 76 for the 14th, 136 in all. About 118, i.e. 116 of these have been found on the broken Turin papyrus. In my chronology, they ruled 937 years, or, or an average of slightly less than 7 years each. I have not discovered any period in history in which 136 consecutive rulers average less than 2 years. Yet, Bress's figures require an average of a 1 and one third years, if the date of 1580 BC is accepted for the 18th dynasty. There are many periods in history where 136 consecutive rulers averages more than 7 years. It is safe to say that 48 different periods of 100 years in different countries could easily be found in which the average reign exceeded, often greatly exceeded 7 years. 
While it is doubtful in any instances of average rains under two years extending over a period of 100 years could be found except the two instances by Breasted. The probability is therefore at least 48 to 2 against the chronology on this ground, 96% in favor of my theory, 4% in favor of his. In addition, the Torrent Papyrus, although fragmented, gives the reigns of 15 identifiable kings on the 13th dynasty, see page 258. They ruled an average of 6 years each. Manitho gives them an average of 7.5 years each, which seems to tally closely with the Torin average of 6 years. We fully agree with Magnaughton in rejecting Breasted's position, which requires each king to reign for an average of one and one-third years each. However, we draw a different conclusion to that of Magnaughton. In our view, Dynasty 13 lasted 453 years, just as Manitho recorded, and Dynasty 14 lasted 184 years. This gives a total of 637 years. Since Dynasty 14 consisted of 76 kings, we believe they must have overlapped with the Dynasty 13 at some uncertain date, possibly 3015 BC, and ruled as the sole kings of Egypt for 184 years after the fall of Dynasty 13. We have selected the date of 3015 BC on two grounds. Dr. Hornung informs us that Neferhotep I of the 13th Dynasty continued to have political influence in Palestine. This implies that he had no rival in the north. Dr. Watterson informs us that Neferhotep I and two successors, Sia Torre and Sebekhotep IV, formed a mini-dynasty. This implies continued political stability until the death of Sebekhotep IV. We conjecture that the 14th dynasty began after his time, hence 3015 BC at the earliest. Clinching the argument over his 12th dynasty date, MacNaughton informed us that the festival of the beginning of the seasons was on the 21st of the 8th month of the Senmorset III's 18th year. As we have seen, the crude probability exceeded 0.99998 plus in favor of 3263 BC. It may be assumed that none would place the date at the previous great festival in 4176 BC, which was not on the 21st of the 8th month. The succeeding great festival was in 2409, but the date fell in the third month, and if any would like to see in this date the 18th year of the Senwar sets the thirds, they would require to postulate an artificial change of five months in the calendar, which seems exceedingly improbable. The festival does not tally at all with the date postulated on the short chronology so that the probability here is 100% in favor of the earlier date. We conclude that Dynasties 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 lasted 1,473 years, calculated as 3182 B.C. for the end of Dynasty 12, minus 1709 B.C. for the rise of Dynasty 18. Incidentally, Africanus gave the figure as 1,439 years, calculated as 453 plus 184 plus 284 plus 518. This is a discrepancy between our view and that of Africanus of just 34 years, i.e. 1473 to 1439. The com this compares favorably with Breasted's discrepancy of 1,231 years, i.e. 1439 to 208. Moreover, the royal canon of Turin names 116 of the 136 kings of dynasties 13 and 14. The Book of Sothis names 30 of the 38 kings of the dynasties 15 and 16. For the Old Kingdom period, Magnaughton claims a date of 5714 BC for the first ascension of Pharaoh Athothis I, i.e. Ahura, the second ruler of the First Dynasty. He based this argument on an interpretation of Egypt royal chronicle called the Palermo Stone. On the second line of the stone, Professor Breasset interprets a 10-year period from the First Dynasty as follows. First year, birth of Anubis. Second year, end of one king's year and the accession of another. Third year, Feast of Deshur. Sixth year, Feast of Sukkar. Seventh year, Birth of the Goddess Yamet. Eighth year, Birth of Min. Ninth year, Birth of Anubis. Tenth year, First Occurrence of the Feast of Zet. Commenting on Breasted's findings, Duncan McNaughton interprets the data thus. It is evident that these are recurring festivals and probable that they recur at regular intervals. They, are all, they all reappear on other parts of the stone in addition to the third line of the Palmero stone. The births of Sheshat and Medef are recorded. The fact that there are five births suggests that, there, that these celebrations have reference to the cycles of the five planets known to the ancients. If the first year is 5715-4, or perhaps 5714-3, 
The phenomena tally thus the date of the rising of Spica being then roughly 24th of August. Please refer to inserted table. McNaughton believes that the astronomical data presented above demonstrates that the first dynasty period described on the Palmero stone must refer to the period of 5715 to 5705 BC. In no other period do we get the astronomical risings or conjunctions of Mercury, Venus, Saturn, and Jupiter. He further supposes that the births of Anubis, Min, etc. that are recorded on the stone are references to the astronomical phenomena. In the second year, 5714 BC, the change of the king is believed by McNaughton to be the death of the pharaoh Mena and the accession of pharaoh Athothis I, i.e. Horaha. On this evidence, he proposed an accession date for Mena of 5776 BC. We disagree. We believe that McNaughton would have to prove that the Egyptians had this level of astronomical knowledge at this very early date. We accept the findings of Charles Dupius, Count de Volney, and Sir William Peck on the early Nile Valley origin of the Zodiac. However, we believe that more evidence is required to show that the Egyptians knew of the planetary movements and held festivals in their honor at this very early date. We do, however, accept that they probably have this information from the Pyramid Age onwards. For this reason, we take the alternative position on the First Dynasty chronology. Furthermore, Mr. McNaughton believes that the king's list of Erethosthenes astronomically dates the periods of several Old Kingdom rulers, such as Ba-Netrer, Kara, Nepka, Yuskaf, Pepi I, Pepi II, etc. He feels that Erethosthenes recorded a list of kings whose dates correspond to the 119-year cycles of Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions. If McNaughton is right, then this is a brilliant piece of deduction on his part. We are, however, much less confident about the Erethosthenes data, and thus we are less happy relying on it. Despite our minor disagreements, the McNaughton chronology provides the best possible synthesis of the known facts about Egyptian history, in our view. It provides the best marriage of research of Manetho, the royal papyrus of Turin, the research of Herodotus, and the astronomical dating, the archaeological dating of Thera, and the new dates for the Sphinx. Nor is his chronology phased by synchronizations with the Middle East or Crete. For example, the early Minoan first period of Crete is traditionally dated to the same period as Pharaoh Mena. How dates were arrived at for the Cretan artifacts before carbon dating had been invented was to measure the depths where the artifacts were found. The deeper the artifacts were buried, the earlier the period. Sir Arthur, Sir Arthur Evans, the early excavator of the site, gave the depths for the end of the Middle Minoan, thir the third period, or the beginning of Late Minoan, as 2.5 meters. This coincided with the 18th Egyptian dynasty. Moreover, he gave the early Minoan, the first period, as 5.33 meters, to cite MacNaughton once more. It will be seen that the depth to a period synchronizing with the commencement of the 18th dynasty, 1709 BC, by my chronology, 1580 by Myers was 2.5 meters. To the present time, i.e. 1932, this represents about 3,600 or 3,500 years or approximately 1440 or 1,400 years per meter. As the depth to the EM, i.e. early Minoan, the first, was 5.32 meters, this yields a date for the beginning of EMI about 7660 or 7448 years before the present time, namely 5730 BC, thus differing very little from my date for Menes, i.e. Mena, arrived at independently 5776 to 5714. Discussion. There are, however, potential problems with this chronology. Dr. Charles Finch discusses radiocarbon dates for pre-dynastic Egyptian sites that are younger than the dynastic dates given here. Professor Fekri Hassan, for example, published six radiocarbon studies on pre-dynastic Egyptian sites between 1980 and 1988. Using high-resolution radiocarbon instruments, he dates the pre-dynastic Badarian culture to 4400 BC at the earliest. His date does, however, contradict the thermoluminescent date of 5500 BC given by Hoffman, author of Egypt Before the Pharaohs. Following Petrie, the Badarian culture should have been much earlier. Both the Hassan and Hoffman dates potentially contradict the Manetho MacNaughton chronology, but then again, they also contradict each other. What should one make of this? 
Chinwezu and Finch both feel that Hoffman's thermoluminescent dates refute the long chronology. According to Chinwezu, Mena's date cannot be earlier or even as early as the earliest stratum of farming settlement at Neken, the town from which he extended his rule to all of Kemet. In absence of TL, i.e. thermoluminescent, and RC, i.e. radiocarbon dates for the stratum at Neken, a probably adequate approximation is that he cannot be earlier than the earliest settlement stratum of any of the earliest farming villages of Upper Kemet. At present, the earliest known is at Hememea with TL date of CA.5580 plus or minus 420 B.C., Hoffman, 1984, 141. This would rule out all dates for Mena that are earlier than the mid-6th millennium BC. If we allow at least 1,000 years for the evolution of the oldest Nile Valley farming villages before their final unification by Mena, that would place Mena sometime after CA 4580 BC. Now, would 1,000 years be too short for the pre-dynastic period? Would it imply an impossibly rapid evolution? Probably not, especially when we consider similar evolutions elsewhere. In the case of Rome, it took just some four centuries, 650 to 250 BC, for three not long settled farming villages to unify and dominate all central and southern Italy. By the Roman yardstick, the march from Nile Valley farming villages to the Pharaonic state could have happened within 400 years, hence allowing at least a thousand years for the pre-dynastic period, comparatively quite conservative. This would put Mena provisionally after 4580 BC. Dr. Chen Wezu's logic is impeccable. Clearly, the Hoffman evidence harmonizes well with this chronology. Nevertheless, a careful reading of the above data reveals that our chronology is not ruled out by Hoffman data. We have been informed that the oldest known farming village in Upper Egypt is dated at 5580 BC, plus or minus 420 years, using thermoluminescent dating. This may mean 6100 BC at the upper end or 5160 BC at the lower end of the spread. We have also been informed that the march from the Nile Valley farming villages to the Pharaonic state could have happened within 400 years. This means that this evolution could have taken place from 6100 BC to 5700 BC. This does not refute our first dynasty date of 5660 BC. Furthermore, Chen Wezu presents evidence that their pre-dynastic period was probably not as long and drawn out as Petrie and Finch seem to think. It could therefore have evolved within a relatively short time span. It should not be presumed that the Bag, Bandarian, Armatian, and Gerzian was entirely pre-dynastic, especially as there is considerable evidence of stylistic continuities between pre-dynastic Bag artifacts and early dynastic artifacts. In fact, as the following examples show, some early dynastic artifacts have indeed been indistinguishable from definitive bag artifacts. A. The Gebel El Arak knife, according to Hoffman, apparently dates to the late Gerzian or proto-dynastic Hoffman 1984-340. This inability to place it in one and not the other period is evidence of the lack of hard stylistic distinction between these periods. B. Commenting on a photograph of a miniature ground stone vase, Hoffman says, Stone vase grinding developed as a full-time craft during the Gerzian and reached a peak under the first two dynasties. Hoffman, 1984-342. C. In emphasizing the continuities between Badarian, Armuration, and Gerzian styles, Alan Gardner points to their, bur to their burial arrangements as basically unchanged. Gardner, 1961-393, and Hoffman carries this picture of the continuity forward into the proto-dynastic era when he notes that the tombs of the proto-dynastic kings at Abydos, although much larger than the pre-dynastic late Gerzian painted tomb, are built according to the same plan. Hoffman, 1984-335. Dr. Hassan recently presented a television program on the BBC entitled Ancient Apocalypse. In this program, he repeatedly suggests a Sixth Dynasty date of 2200 BC without qualification or discussion. His Old Kingdom dates are, therefore, younger than the only reasonable Twelfth Dynasty dates given as 3440 BC by Manetho. The Hassan chronology, therefore, cannot be accepted and there is worse to come. Of the thermoluminescent date given by Hoffman, on the other hand, we accept that if fully verified, it would undermine the long chronology presented here. 
Unfortunately, he too is a supporter of the short chronology and thus presents Old Kingdom dates that are younger than the only acceptable Middle Kingdom dates. The radiocarbon dates are not as impressive as they first seem. The radiocarbon web info site gave the following information on the origin of this dating technique. The radiocarbon method was developed by a team of scientists led by the late Professor William Willard F. Libby of the University of Chicago after the end of World War II. Libby later received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1960 for the radiocarbon discovery. Today, there are over 130 radiocarbon dating laboratories around the world producing radiocarbon dates for the scientific community. The C14 method has been and continues to be applied and used in many, many different fields, including hydrology, atmospheric science, oceanography, geology, paleoclimatology, archaeology, and biomedicine. There is a section on the web page entitled, How Did Libby Test His Method and Find Out If It Worked Correctly? In this section, we are informed that Libby tested the new radiocarbon method on carbon samples from prehistoric Egypt, whose age was known. A sample of acacia wood from the tomb of the pharaoh Zoser was dated for example. Zoser lived during the Third Dynasty in Egypt, 2700 to 2600 BC. Libby figured that since the half-life of C14 was 5,568 years, they should obtain a radiocarbon amount of about 50% of that which was found in living wood because Zoser's death was about 5,000 years ago. The result they obtained indicated that this was the case. Many other ra radiocarbon dates were conducted on samples of wood of known age. Again, the results were good. In 1949, Libby and his team published the results. By the early 1950s, there were eight new radiocarbon laboratories, and by the end of the decade, more than 20. Among Libby's other data included our artifacts from the time of Hemeka, First Dynasty, given as 5,000 years old, Seneferu, given as 4,500 years old, and a boat dated to the time of Sestris, given as 3,900 years old. Like his date for the Djoser, his dates of Hemeka, Seneferu, and Sosostris, probably one of the 12th dynasty kings, were based on Egyptian samples whose age was known. But how did Libby know that these dates were known? Known by whom exactly? In reality, Libby seems to have accepted the chronology of Breasted, who incidentally worked at the same ac academic factory. The University of Chicago. Breasted's dates are, however, unreliable. To assess the reliability of C-14, consider the following dates reported by Schwaller de Lubbox in Sacred Science. He reports that Hemeka has been dated to 2923 B.C., give or minus 250 years, Zoser to 1830 B.C., give or minus 650 years, Seneferu, 2852 B.C., give or minus 210 years, and Senwaraset III, 1671 B.C., give or minus 180 years. In other words, 71 years separates the 1st and 4th dynasties. Seneferu reigned 1,032 years before Zoser, and finally 159 years separates the 3rd and 12th dynasties. All this is frankly embarrassing. Moreover, one of the dates for Seneferu of the 4th dynasty was given at 3598 BC. This is over 600 years earlier than Hemeka of the 1st dynasty. What is worse now of these dates agrees with those of Professor Libby, who supposedly used the same method to date the same artifacts. In fact, few of the published carbon dates given by different authorities agree with each other. However, each time the carbon dates were published, they were presented to the public as though they were the final word on the subject. Professor Lenner, Herbert House, and colleagues recently analyzed organic remains from the Ten Old Kingdom monuments using the new and improved radiocarbon dating technique. They found that the buildings were minimally 400 years older than the standard short chronology dates would lead us to expect. For example, they published 16 out of 50 samples taken from the Great Pyramid of Giza. The oldest sample published was found to date at 3809 BC, but the youngest sample was 2853 BC. Leonard Haas et al. concluded that the pyramid was minimally 389 years older than the short chronology date of 2464 BC. On this basis, Dr. Finch proposes moving the short chronology first dynasty back from 3100 BC to 3500 BC. We disagree. We believe that if these dates are to be accepted, surely it should be the oldest or the median dates that should be used, and not the latest one. The oldest radiocarbon dates should reflect the oldest known piece of organic material on the monument. 
However, the younger pieces of organic material could have got there at any time since the monument was constructed. This is of some importance in the light of the research of Mark McCarran. In a provocative internet paper, Mr. McCarran shows the recent research at Oregon University has demonstrated the C14 dates tend to be 15% too low when compared to tree ring dates. This effectively pushes the 3809 BC date from the Great Pyramid back to 4226 BC. This is younger than our date of 4794 BC, but is much closer to it than the 2877 BC of Breasted or the 2600 BC used today. To explore all possibilities should the median dates of Leonard A.L. be considered. The median date for the Great Period may well turn out to be 3400 B.C., excepting for the sake of argument, Leonard's dates, or 3705 B.C., according to McCarran. These dates may support chronology in between the ideas of Petrie and Breasted, such as the one advocated by Budge or the chronology at one time advocated by Finch. In Echoes of the Old Darkland, Charles Finch advocated a First Dynasty date of 4300 B.C., his theory is a fascinating and well-argued synthesis of Manitho, astronomy, and religion. More recently, Dr. Chin Wenzu has developed these ideas with even greater sophistication into a chronology with a first dynasty date of 4443 BC. It is widely believed that the Egyptian calendar was established by at least 4241 BC. The evidence for this assertion is derived from the writings of Herodotus. In the histories, the Greek historian alludes, in a very cryptic way, to a unique feature of the Egyptian calendar. The Egyptians invented the novel idea of having two calendars running simultaneously. One calendar lasted 365 and a quarter days, which is close to the calendar we use today, and the other lasted 365 days. After four years, the two calendars would diverge by one day. After eight years, they would diverge by two days. Continuing the computations further, after... 1,460 years, the two calendars would diverge by a whole year. The two calendars would be so far apart that they would actually meet up with each other. A Roman historian, Censorinus, informs us that the two calendars agreed in 139 AD. The two calendars must therefore have met up in 1321 BC, since this is 1,460 years earlier. In a statement analyzed by many historians such as George Rawlinson and Walter Marsham Adams, Herodotus implied that the two calendars met up on two previous cycles. This gives 4241 BC as the first definite Egyptian date, calculated as 30, 1321 plus 1460 times 2 equals 4241. The beginning of the Egyptian year was July 19th, the first day of Thoth. Associate it with the rising of the star Sothis, supposedly Sirius. Bringing the information together, a Sothic cycle began on 19th July, 4241 BC. A second one began on 19th July, 2781 BC. And the third one began on 19th July, 1321 BC, etc. Dr. Finch reproduces an ivory tablet associated with Pharaoh Jur on the First Dynasty. The tablet reads, Sothis, opener of the year, in the nation the first. On this evidence, the learned scholar believes this fixes a date for when Pharaoh Jur flourished, i.e. 4241 BC. Unfortunately, Finch's seductive theory collapses over pre precisely the same hurdle as Breasted's. Dr. Finch proposed the 11th or 12th dynasty date that starts between 2238 and 2218 BC. This implies that same Middle Kingdom dates as given by Breasted with exactly the same consequence. The late date comp compresses the 13th through 17th dynasties into an unlikely 208 years, when the minimum he could logically argue for is 453 years. Chen Wezu's chronology suffers from exactly the same problem, except that his time gap is 211 years. Finally, are Rawlinson, Adams, and Finch correct in their interpretation of Herodotus? Following Duncan McNaughton, it seemed that the scholars have again confused Sirius with Spica. We note that even Leo de Put the modern authority on Egyptian calendar cited earlier uncritically links Sirius with Sothis. Consequently, the enigmatic statement of Herodotus may well have a completely different interpretation, according to McNaughton. The first cycle began about 5578 BC, the second about 4152, the third about 2736, and the fourth about 1314, so that the period of by which Herodotus was writing about was halfway through the fourth cycle. 
We believe that 5578 BC is the true period that the pharaoh Jur flourished, a date consistent with the Manitho Africanus chronology, though disagreeing with McNaughton's date. On this basis, we offer a first dynasty date of 5660 BC. Incidentally, Africanus gave the final year of Jur as 5598 BC, a discrepancy, a discrepancy between our view and his of 20 or more years. Breasted, on the other hand, does not use Jur tablet. It is possible that he was unaware of it. However, even if he was made aware of it, we shall show that it completely destroys his chronology. We conclude that, considering the remote dates involved with the Jur tablet, we believe that the Manitho chronology is vindicated. Moreover, we have demonstrated that using the Spica theory with the month of Hathor as the start of the new year consistently produces smaller discrepancies with Africanus than using the Sirius theory with Thoth as the start of the new year. The Sphinx of Giza provides another problem concerning the manitho McNaughton chronology. Professor Hornung tells us that the Great Sphinx of Giza dates to the reign of Kephrephren, i.e. Kafra. According to Vivian Davies and Renee Friedman in a recent book published by the British Museum, Kafra added something unique. This was the Sphinx, which presides over Giza and art history as the first royal statue in Egypt. Professor Lenner, regarded as one of the world's foremost authorities on Giza, contextualizes the Sphinx in his view. The Sphinx does not sit out alone in the desert totally up for grabs. The Sphinx is surrounded by a vast architectural context which includes the Pyramid of Khufu, the Pyramid of Kafra, and the Pyramid of Menekare pharaohs of the fourth dynasty. He continues by showing that the builders conceived of the Sphinx and Khafra's temple as one unit. The south side of the Sphinx ditch forms the northern edge of the Khafra causeway as it runs past the Sphinx and enters Khafra's valley temple. A drainage channel along, runs along the northern side of the causeway and opens into an upper southwest corner of the Sphinx ditch. Suggested that the ancient quarrymen formed the ditch after the Khafra causeway was built. On the question of who built the Sphinx, Robert Bovell and Graham Hancock, two radical historians, take a distinctly minority view. They believe that Pharaoh Khafra merely restored the Sphinx. Like many pharaohs after him, Ramses II, Thutmosis IV, Ah Moses I, etc., etc. Finally, Lieutenant Frank Domingo, senior forensic artist with the New York Police Department, made a special study on the facial portrait of the Sphinx and compared it with the famous sculpture of Pharaoh Khafra. He concluded that, After reviewing my various drawings, schematics, and measurements, my final conclusion concurs with an initial reaction, i.e., that the two works represent two separate individuals. The proportions in the frontal view, and especially the angles and facial protrusion in the lateral views, convince me that the Sphinx is not Khafra. Synthesizing the idea of Davies and Friedman, Hornung, Leonard, Bovell, and Hancock, and Domingo, we believe that Khafra originally built the Sphinx. He constructed it during the Fourth Dynasty where it was part of the Giza complex of pyramids, causeways, and temples. Later, kings restored the monument, and it was for the reason that the portrait no longer resembles Khafra. The date of the Sphinx, and therefore the Fourth Dynasty, has already been given at 5000 BC at this latest. As discussed in an earlier chapter, Professor Schock's geological dating remains unrefuted by anyone. Schock, however, regarded his dates as conservative. If the Sphinx could not shown to date back to, say, 6000 BC or earlier, this would prove too early to harmonize with the manitho McNaughton chronology. The dating of Pharaoh Mena is the final problem of which we are aware concerning the manitho McNaughton chronology. It is well known that northern Egypt was largely swamplands in the pre-dynastic periods that tended to discourage human habitation. Herodotus credits Mena with building a dam that diverted the course of the Nile and rendered lower Egypt more suitable for human habitation. At what date did all this take place? Walter Fairservice wrote that, During the Pliocene period, that is, the latest period before the coming of the Ice Age, Pleistocene, it has been noted that an arm of the ancient Mediterranean protruded along the Nile Valley. This arm or gulf reached almost to the present dam at Aswan, or at least 400 miles along the present Nile Valley, and is well over 500 feet above the present sea level. During this period, heavy rainfall caused the surrounding streams that fed into the Proto-Nile Valley to empty their vast quantity of gravel and silts. The gulf filled with erosional deposits, and this caused a retreat of the sea arm. This may have been helped by the fall of the sea as the Mediterranean found its modern bed. 
the Pleistocene and the so-called Ice Age are practically synonymous. The period began perhaps 1 million years ago and ended around 10,000 BC. The above data could be synthesized with the ideas of Herodotus to date the reign of Mena to a period before 10,000 BC. If Herodotus recorded correctly, Mena must have lived at a time when much of Egypt was swampland. Fair service gives the latest possible date when this was the case of 10,000 BC. This is clearly a much earlier date than our 5660 or MacNaughton's 5776 BC. As with the Sphinx, the data may indicate that a much long, longer chronology is required than given by Manitho. Conclusion Tying the arguments and evidence together, the Manitho MacNaughton chronology is clearly the best synthesis known to Egyptology. In fact, it is the only logical chronology that has been presented to the academic world. Clearly, it has been updated in the light of new archaeological discoveries on the names, order, and length of reigns of the kings, especially from the Old Kingdom period. We believe that Professor Jackson, author of the masterly Man, God, and Civilization, was justified in popularizing McNaughton's work. On the other hand, there was no hiding from the problems of the long chronology. Thermoluminescent dates for the pre-dynastic period do not harmonize as well with it as other chronologies, but the radiocarbon dates from the Old Kingdom monuments are hard to interpret. New dates for the Sphinx, however, may indicate that the manitho macnaughton chronology is too conservative and even longer chronology needs to be adopted. The issue surrounding the dating of Mena tends also to suggest a longer chronology. These issues remain unsettled, but a clear position emerges. The meyer bresset chronology is a complete failure. There are four major problems with the short chronology that undermine its credibility. Firstly, the chronology involves a total rejection of the best Egyptian, and for that matter, the best Greek sources. Worthwhile history cannot be written in this way. The 925 years Bresset gives for the first six dynasties, for example, comes from nothing more than his imagination. Secondly, a minimum, a minimum of 116 kings ruling in 208 years is highly improbable at best and contradicts Meyer and Bresset's own arguments concerning simultaneous dynasties. Had these scholars been consistent, they should have proposed a minimum period for the 13th to 17th dynasties of 518 to 453 years, not 208 years. Additionally, there are three separate pieces of evidence that pulls the 18th dynasty back over 100 years before Breasted's date. The Nabodunus document, the Karnak water clock, and the eruption of Thera. Since the 18th dynasty began in 1709 BC, this allows a time gap of 71 years from the fall of the 12th dynasty to rise of, of the 18th dynasty. Since there are 15 recognizable kings on the turn fragments with their length of reigns intact, we can account for 91 years of the 13th dynasty. This alone refutes the Breasted position since 91 years is greater than the 71 years that the evidence allows Breasted to claim. Thirdly, the Sothic tablet for Pharaoh Jur completely demolishes the 3180 BC or 3400 BC First Dynasty dates. If the calendar was invented in 4241 BC, following the serious argument, the Egyptians must have an advanced record keeping at at least 800 years before the writing system to document it emerged in the dynastic period following the Meyer Breasted chronology. H.E. Winlock, a former director at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, noticed the absurdity of this and proposed instead the calendar must have been invented at the next Sothic cycle, i.e. 2781 BC. He actually gave the date as 2773 BC. Winlock hinted, but was careful not to say, that Imahotep of the Third Dynasty invented the calendar. Since the Third Dynasty began in 2980 BC, following Breasted, Winlock proposed that the entire Third Dynasty should be moved forward to coincide with the birth of the calendar. This involved cutting a, fur a further 200 years off the Old Kingdom chronology. If the Sothic calendar was invented in the Third Dynasty period of 2781 or 2773 BC, as Winlock claims, then how can he explain the First Dynasty tablet with a Sothic date on it? The First Dynasty period of Pharaoh Jur is still at least 200 years earlier than the proposed invention of the calendar. Moreover, using the spigot dates instead of the serious ones won't help Breasted, Meyer, or Winlock. The nearest relevant dates are either 4182 BC or 2736 BC. Finally, Professor Breasted himself revealed that he did not fully believe his own propaganda. In his influential Ancient Records of Egypt, Volume 1, Breasted let his guard slip and wrote the following bizarre passage. The calendar was introduced in the middle of the 43rd century BC, 
4241 BC. This is the oldest fixed date in history. This fact demonstrates not only a remarkable degree of scientific knowledge in that remote age, but also stable political conditions and wide recognition of central authority, which could gradually introduce such an innovation. The date employed was that for the rising of Southus in the latitude of Memphis or the southern delta. In other words, the unification of Egypt, the birth of kingship, and the foundation of Memphis were necessary conditions for the birth of the calendar. The earliest time Egypt is known to have met these conditions is during the First Dynasty. Consequently, the strange passage may indicate that Perez's true position is not so far away from that of Finch or Chen Wenzu, but the damage had already been done. Generations of scholars regarded the short chronology as canonical, when it should have merited a little consideration. Meyer and Breasted, according to Professor Jackson, had more sinister reason for downdating the Egyptian chronology. The reason why they clipped 2,000 years off the chronology, explains Jackson, is in order to make Egyptian culture fit into the Bible. Christian Bigas had argued that the world was created in around 4004 BC, using the good book as their main source. Any Egyptian dates older than this were unacceptable to Christian historians. Even today, newer texts are creeping closer and closer to the Wilkinson date of 2320 BC. Some radical historians, such as David Roll, are defending very low dates and evoke the Bible as evidence to support this position. In Legend, the Genesis of Civilization, Mr. Roll proposes a first dynasty date of 2789 BC. In support of Mr. Roll, a, at least the Jur tablet does not inconvenience his chronology. The medium chronologies of Budge, Chen Wezu, Finch in 1990, and Petrie in 1929 are also far less satisfactory than the chronology presented here. The Finch and Chen Wenzu chronologies are tied to Breasted's Middle Kingdom dates, as we have seen. The chronologies of Bud and Petrie in 1929, on the other hand, involve a total rejection of Senwar Set III, Sothic date. This is clearly less acceptable than the McNaughton chronology that incorporates it. The only advantages of this medium chronology are the better able to incorporate the new carbon dates for the Old Kingdom monuments and harmonize better with the thermoluminescent dates given by Hoffman. This, of course, presumes that the carbon dates are reliable and there is no evidence in existence to show that they are. Furthermore, the thermoluminescent dates do not rule out the long chronology as Finch and Chen Wenzu seem to think. On the other hand, the medium dates are further away from the geological dates for the Sphinx than those of the long chronology. They are also further away from the date of Pleistocene, which may give an independent date for Mena. In conclusion, as a synthesis of the available data, the long chronology clearly emerges as superior to its rivals.